Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll selfishly be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. Zurich is the proud partner supporting this episode. As one of Australia's largest life insurers, Zurich encourages the promotion of positive conversations leading to a more sustainable future for life insurance. Committed to championing financial advice through education and research-led market insights. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor crew here. And today I'm pumped to be here with the one and only Mr. Michael back from Human to Human. My, uh, Michael is a, uh, I don't know, you know what you call him, a marketing super genius team overlord, uh, client experience, something, something. Uh, Backy, thanks for joining us, buddy. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me on, Ben. Mate, uh, it's always a pleasure chatting to you, and I'm keen to to pick your brain on um, a bunch of things today. But yeah, I I know that you through your work, you work with a lot of different advice businesses, so you um, you see from the people in the trenches. So I thought a good place to start was talking a bit about what are the trends that you're seeing. At the moment, obviously, a bit of a weird sort of a dynamic in the market. You know, we've got people coming out of COVID, markets up, markets down, um, advisor numbers up, down, all over the place, compliance through the roof. Uh, yeah, mate, what are you seeing out there? So it's obviously been a very interesting couple of years uh, for, for a range of reasons. Uh, but particularly for financial advisors, I think uh, all the business owners I work with out there had that oh crap moment at the start of COVID where they thought, you know, we're, we're a luxury good, we're not an essential good, uh, we're going to be the first thing cut from people's budgets. Um, and, you know, the pe- people saw the, <laughs> the demise of their business playing out before their eyes. And, you know, JobKeeper probably helped things tremendously. Um, but ultimately, I think what a lot of advisors and particularly younger advisors who hadn't been through a crisis before learned was that, uh, we're not really in the advice game here. We're in the certainty game. And at times when people were less certain than ever, um, they almost ran out the door, you know, digitally to uh, to find financial advisors to give them comfort and certainty to make sure they were making the right moves. So uh, probably for the first time in, you know, I've been, been in the industry over a decade, but I think for the first time in, in that period of time, uh, I would say finding new clients and new business is not the biggest challenge that financial advisors are experiencing. I think uh, the quality of leads that people are getting is a challenge. So some people are getting um, you know, a mix of leads and not necessarily their ideal clients, but for the most part, business growth isn't a tremendous challenge. The, the perfect storm that has transpired though is that with all the regulation, uh, with the, the aftermath of the Royal Commission, um, the, the pain of bringing on a client and, and the amount of steps required in an onboarding process if you combine that with the amount of new business that's coming in the door, it's creating huge amounts of pain and tremendous bottlenecks in the onboarding experience for a lot of advice firms. So I think most most businesses that I'm speaking to out there are experiencing a lot of back office pain. And um, there's this vision in their brain as to it, it just should be easier. We've got all this technology, yet our life is harder than ever. And bridging that gap between where they are and using all these tools that they either already have or that are out there and they're hearing people talk about but bridging that gap between their business as usual and all this great technology that's supposed to save them time it is a really really big pain point that i'm seeing out there so that's probably one of the biggest struggles that i'm seeing yeah definitely i know for us like we're just in the middle of a big tech transition and it still blows me away with all the advisors out there and all the money that's in advice and advice tech that it's still not um yeah, simple and and seamless when it comes to a lot of this stuff. And I think we've gone down the path of let's pick the best of breed, you know, tech in their categories and uh, try and figure out a way to get them to talk to each other. But 
realize that, especially in a, in a business that's been growing and we've been experiencing a fair bit of that growth that you mentioned off the back of the COVID disruption, that duplication of data creates, especially mm -hmm. with the, the spotlight more on compliance, um, mm -hmm. apart from being inefficient, it creates a huge amount of risk risk to from a compliance perspective and then risk with your clients and um yeah just an, an enormous amount of rework so having having a tech stack that actually talks to each other and minimizes that double handling i think is a huge huge opportunity for um for efficiency but would also totally agree with those comments we certainly did uh panic stations in the the front end of covid my business seized up we um we certainly were a luxury good. I think it was like six weeks where it was just crickets for mm -hmm. from a new client perspective, which I suppose is understandable. But then the floodgates opened and mm -hmm. uh, kicking off from that point. And since then, for us at least, it's been definitely those challenges around onboarding clients. But then in when there's tons of work to do, how do you manage it effectively from a one tech perspective, but two from a from a team perspective and setting your team up for success, dealing with the, you know, personal impact, I suppose, of COVID lockdowns and people working from their bunker and not being able to do the same things and uh, that you could do pre-COVID and uh, yeah, then people have got personal stuff going on and obviously it's impacted, I think, everybody's mental health to some level in, in terms of, you know, human, as much as I always thought that I could work from a dark cave um, for the rest of my life and COVID has put that one to the, to the test. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly challenging. And I think that, that, you know, along with the growth and something that I've seen from talking to a lot of advisors through this podcast is... Yeah, that that team thing is a real issue. Finding good people, supporting them in the right way, getting them to work effectively, and um, yeah, it's it's absolutely not easy because everyone is their own snowflake and different approaches, and then you've got to take a business view. So, yeah, I thought like I know that you you have helped me a lot with our team team flow, how we work together, um, ideas and initiatives to support the team better and ultimately to work towards being more productive and effective in the work that we're doing to drive better business outcomes. What do you see, like, what are some of the mistakes that people make when it comes to team? Yeah, there's a whole bunch. And I mean, I, I think the first thing to mention uh, really is that there, that there's, there's no judgment here. Like a lot of the time, and it, it's the classic um, case that was so well articulated in Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth, but uh, yeah, most of the time people start a business because they're really great at what they do. They're a great technician. They're a great advisor. Um, and he calls it an entrepreneurial seizure. So they go, well, hold on, I'm making, you know, this business, all this money, and I'm only getting paid this. I may as well do it myself. And then they start their own business and they're still wearing their advisor hat far too often. And all of a sudden they build the business to a point where, uh, you know, the income might be slightly higher, but they're working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Um, they are absolutely struggling to take any time off. And, and it's almost like they, they haven't really started a business. They've, they've bought themselves a, bo a job with, with the worst possible boss imaginable. Um, and really the, the message in that book is that, you know, there's three essential roles um, that are required for a business. There's the visionary, uh, there's the technician and there's the glue in the middle that translates the visionary's vision into an operational flow that, that helps make that vision a reality. And so I suppose uh, that the reason I bring that up is that a lot of people out there who perhaps um, are really great advisors running businesses but don't feel like they've got a great culture, don't feel like they're doing a good job of hiring, um, perhaps look at their team and go, I feel like I can be getting more out of these guys and making this a better place to work and, and having everyone way more productive and engaged, um, but I just can't quite crack the code. You're not alone. It's one of the most common things I see out there. And so suppose, yeah, you can't be good at everything. And part of the journey of a business owner is becoming a better leader. And so this is probably where the heart of a lot of these mistakes lies. Yeah, look, I think it's um, like you say that you, a lot of people, I know myself, when I started my business, I didn't like I was I was trying to buy into the previous business that I was working in that didn't end up working out and uh, I wanted to keep being an advisor and there were some things that I wanted to do a little bit differently but I just didn't want to have a boss I just wanted to do great advice and for for 
three and a half years. I did that myself. I wrote my wife in after a year, well, my now wife. And um, uh, I think if you asked her about my management and leadership skills, she, um, I, I don't know if this podcast is rated, uh, but uh, you might get an interesting response. Um, but then you go, well, okay, I can't, can't do all this work myself or don't want to do all this work myself or want to have some of that freedom, which is why people start businesses, why I started a business or one of the reasons at least in the, in the first place and realize that you need to get a team around you, but it's a whole different skill set approach, the things that you need to, um, yeah, to, to, to know and, and look forward to create that glue. And I think that, for, for micro, like for my business, it's a micro business that grows into a small business and in a perfect world, you go, okay, well, yeah, we need the glue. Let's, who's awesome at that and who knows all the stuff and then let's just go pay them some money and get them to do it. But like you've mm. got to balance resourcing revenue, you know, where the business is at, trying to actually make a buck. Um, and yeah, you can't, you can't just um, do that. But in on top of that, one of the things that I've realized for, for myself, um, at, well, at least I, I think is correct, is that as a leader in the business, you you also need to take that responsibility. Like it's not really, especially in a small, small business, that it's not something that you can really delegate. Um, yeah. I have historically like done, done it myself and probably done it half ass because I'd rather tinker around with the spreadsheet or work on a marketing strategy or deal with the client and, and do those sorts of things to, to grow the business than I would to run a team meeting or a one-on-one with it, with a team member. And you sort of almost see them as the unnecessary, um, well, maybe not unnecessary, but it's the sort of thing. It's like your financial success or doing a workout session or something. It's one of those things that's important, not urgent, and it's easy to not do in the moment. But mm. then the compounding effect of not doing it and not doing it and not doing it means that you end up unhealthy, you know, um, overweight with a shit team. Um, mm. And then you need to, you need to um, work probably, you know, twice as hard to, to, to change things and, and change those habits. So uh, I have now fortunate to have some great team in place that, can help but from a leadership team perspective can help with the leadership of the broader team mm-hmm. but i've still and this is only a, a thing that i've been heavily focused on team in the last sort of six to 12 is probably six really um is that i still need to be the driver and across all of the things even if i'm not doing the one that's doing all of the things mm-hmm. um so I think in terms of mistakes, it's probably fair to say that I've made them all and then some, but what are the biggest <laughs> ones that, that you see from um, from people when it comes specifically to how they set up their teams and, and from a team perspective? Yeah, so I was giving this some thought before the podcast and, and I've distilled it down to three common mistakes that I see um, advisor business owners make. Um, and a lot of this, um, you know, it's rooted in exactly what you said before too around you know, but I think one of the mistakes that people make, and I mean, this is almost a bonus fourth, but I think it's like the foundation of everything, is that a lot of the time advisors start a business because they themselves want to do it a certain way, but they assume that the rest of their team are the same. <clears throat> when in fact, if you think about the type of person who wants to be an employee, wants to stay in a business, they actually want to be led. So. I think probably the first thing that people need to think about is that this isn't just about, um, you know, telling people what to do. You know, you're the type of person, Ben, who probably doesn't love being told what to do or love being bossed around. And that's why he started a business. But there is also a love, a type of person who loves clarity and loves knowing what's expected of them and loves meeting those expectations and loves turning up every day and going, I know if I can do these things, I'm going to be productive in this organization. I'm going to be contributing to something bigger and that's going to make me feel good. So It's not necessarily a case that someone like you needs to be a better leader because that's going to make the business successful, but your team actually want you to be a better leader as well. And I know in your case, you've got a senior leadership team. That's the same with them as well. They want to know, they want you to paint an exciting vision for them. They want you to take the business into new areas. And so uh, this isn't a self-serving thing to become a great leader. It's actually what the people who work in your organization need and want from you as well. Yeah, I read a really, well, um, 
listened to a really interesting audio book recently called The Motive, which was a, a real sort of game changer. Got referred to um, me by another business owner, and it talks all about the fact that CEO. They were talking about C. It's like a sort of um, narrative type thing about this CEO, and they talk about the fact that it's not that. Um, a CEO shouldn't be a leader because they want to be the boss. It's that they're a leader because they're ready to put in the work to support their team in the best mm. way possible to, to get the mm. most out of them. And, uh, yeah, it really sort of struck a chord that um, it's not about you, it's about them. But I would agree with with those comments as well that I'm, I'm the sort of, like, boss that I, I don't like being a boss. I don't want to be mm. anyone's boss. I just want to mm. – I. Um, yeah, like I, I, I just want to run a good business, and but mm. so I sort of shirk away from having sort of clear, you know, sort of bit clear rules or being strict with mm. people and that sort of stuff. But sometimes, and not to say that you need to be strict, but having clear guidelines, it gives people the lanes that they can work in, and they go, yeah, okay, the, this is the expectations, and this is what's there. And I know for us, and one of the things that I've been working on in the over the last, just the last actually few weeks is like sort of formalizing the core competencies that I think are necessary for each of our team members to be in my mind successful in their role. And it's things like, things like their contribution to team flow and team rhythm. So not just, you know, doing a good job if you're an advisor or an associate or a power planner or a marketing person or whatever, but it's that you actually lean into meetings and realize that a meeting is not about you it's about the team and that the, the mm-hmm. meetings are there to to do that so it's funny that you you something like that which seems so obvious but then you you unpack it for someone and they're like oh oh yeah that's interesting but it's potentially something that they maybe just haven't thought of or haven't mm-hmm. realized is as important as what it actually is and it's funny i know that you've helped me with a number of other things in the past that you know you you say these things because we think so much, especially as business owners, like you think so much in your head about stuff and the team and that you're there and you want to you want to look after your team, you want to develop your team, you want to support them, you want them to be happy. But sometimes you say, I remember you told me that we were going through a bit of culture change at one point and um, working with a team member and said to tell them that I really wanted them to be part of the team. And I'm like, that's fucking ridiculous. Like, of course I want them to be part of the team. That's why I hired them and why I continue to pay their wage every every month. But then I, I said, I was like, I really value you and I want you to be part of the team. And I'm like, oh, wow. Like, thank you so much for saying that. And I'm like, <laughs> God, like, what the fuck? <laughs> But it's these simple things that I think we take for granted and go, well, mm-hmm that's that's blatantly obvious to us but it's not always mm. obvious to every person and it's um a lot of the i've been smashing the blink list as i've told you last time we were talking on like these snippets of books and a thing that keeps coming up is that the leaders in the business are chief reminding officers to just keep you know yep. banging on about things and i'm always reluctant to do that like i think a lot of people are but People yeah. need that you need to be telling people the the things that they should be thinking about, so they're mm. thinking about the right things. Otherwise, they're you know there's too much noise and there's um, enough noise in the world, so it's, it ends yeah. up being really really ineffective. Um, well, and that dovetails absolutely perfectly into the first mistake that that I outlined here, which is that um, most business leaders assume their time their team are mind readers and. You know, to be quite blunt, they don't think about the business anywhere near as much as you do. And so a lot of the time when you say things, they in the moment they go, oh, yeah, I get it, cool. And then something else happens in their job or in their life. And all of a sudden it's it's all too forgotten. And you might remind them in a few months, they go, oh, that's right. Yeah, we did say we were going to do that. Or, oh, yeah, I was going to focus on that, but I've completely forgotten. So actually one of the biggest favours that you can do to your team is to continually remind them of the important things. And Ben, you've heard me wheel this one out many times, but my concept of the success triangle, uh, which is, you know, in order to be successful in anything, you've got to have three things. You've got to have clarity, capability, and motivation. So to put that in a different way, clarity, you've got to know what success is and you've got to like know what you're doing. Capability, you've got to be able to do it. So you've got to have the skills, the knowledge, the time, um, the talent in order to achieve that version of success. And then motivation. So 
you know, you might know how to be successful. You might have all the skills, but you just mightn't want to be successful. You're never going to get there. So you need to have all three of those things in balance, whether it's within your business or as a person. Uh, but the one of those three areas where time and time again, I feel like success is sabotaged is clarity. People assume things are clear and they're not. Uh, and as a leader, you get frustrated because things aren't happening the way they should or people aren't focusing on the right things. Uh, and most of the time, that's because you just haven't made it as clear as you think you have. So that's there's probably a chance that whatever that important message is for your team that they're not connecting with, you've got to say it enough times that you can actually, they start finishing the sentence for you. And only when you've got to that point where you go, right, they're sick of hearing this, that's probably the moment when they actually have truly absorbed and understood it. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the success triangle and I actually bring it into some of the conversations that we we have with team because I've found from doing it that sometimes there'll be things that you work on and that the clarity is an issue um, or is the issue at the start, but then you can work to make things clear and then you might need to develop capabilities or drive motivation in different things yeah. as well. But I think it's not to say that someone's not motivated to do something at at one point in time that they're never going to be motivated to do it or on the flip side if they were motivated once they can lose that motivation if um you know depending on what happens as well so uh i that's a really interesting hack that i'm like if there's a problem i'm like well is it clear mm -hmm. are they capable mm -hmm. you know is, is the motivation there and i think it's a good way to develop the team when you realize that there's or recognize that there's either a focus area or something that's important yeah. um the, the, I suppose when it comes to clarity, like to make this really tangible to people out there listening, uh, there's there's two layers of clarity, right? Like there's um, how do I do my job? What's expected of me? What's the process for running this meeting? What's the process after this meeting? How do I you know, turn a, a, an advice discussion into a power planning request? Like there's, there's process there. Um, and that's got to be super clear. And particularly as your business grows, the less clear that is, the more variability you're going to have in that. Um, I think you touched on this before, but like clarity around critical numbers. So, um, you know, a big part of the journey of being a better leader is not dictating every single input that goes into the process, but respecting the fact that you've hired intelligent people who might have a different way of getting to the outcome that you would, but that works better for them, or it might even be way better than the way that you would get there. And as long as you hire good people and make sure that they're focused on the right outcomes, they can chart the path from where you are now to where you want the business to be. And so giving people visibility and clarity over what those numbers are and reminding them of, you know, what the what what the target is, where they're up to, having a discussion about what not what might not be working, but almost letting the magic of a great employee help you get there um, by just focusing on it more frequently. That's a really big part of it. Um, but the, the one that I reckon, like I, I think most people out there would probably go, yeah, okay, I know I don't have clear processes, but I already knew that was important. Or I know critical numbers, yeah, I've been thinking about that, but I haven't you know, got there. But the one that a lot of people underestimate, and in many ways I'd say it's the layer of clarity that, that could potentially have the biggest impact on your business, uh, is really around how to act. So not just how to do your job, but like how do we choose to behave as people and human beings in this team? And so what I'm talking about there is core values. Uh, when I started out as a business coach, um, to be perfectly honest, I thought like core values were the biggest load of length that I'd heard in my life. I thought it was something that people in, you know, lecture theaters who are lecturing on business talked about, but in the real world, you know, in successful businesses, this stuff doesn't actually matter. Uh, and I've done a complete 180 on that in seeing the difference between good teams and great teams uh, in my career, literally core values that are not just clear, but are lived every single day is like one of the biggest differences between a good team and a great team. Uh, and a lot of the time, you know, the problem with something like values is I, I can see from a business owner's point of view, they don't wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, God, I've just got a core values problem. We need to solve that. It, it doesn't ever feel like it's the solution to anything. Um, but really, you know, any team has an implicit understanding of like what we accept and what we don't like around here, right? And there's probably a combination of good behaviors that are happening, but you just haven't made them clear. But there's probably also things that as a business leader, you get frustrated by and you go, I wish the team were more this way. So that's where the clarity piece comes in. But in terms of the problems that it helps solve, um, 
core values, if you've got a really great set of core values that the team have all bought into and they are like an important part of the DNA, they're going to help you hire. Like they can become criteria through which when you're hiring someone, you go, they look like they're going to do the job, but they're not going to fit in because not just because of our vibe, but because there's five things here and we ask questions around those five core values and they didn't really do too well. So we're saving ourselves a headache in the future. Uh, there's something that the best teams talk about in their team one-on-ones. You know, it's not just how you're doing at your job. It's like, which value are you living the strongest? Which value could you be focusing the most on? Um, and really the best part about that is it's not as a, as a leader or anyone in a business, it doesn't mean to be a leader, instead of giving someone feedback and saying, I don't like when you do this or this is not how I want you to be. It's like, well, you're not letting me down as a person. You agreed to these values. We've made them really clear to you since day dot. And here's the one that I think that perhaps you need to be working on. So it's kind of externalizing the feedback where um, it, it's people holding themselves against the standard that they've been part of creating, not just someone's opinion or, or some, yeah, it doesn't feel as personal. Absolutely. And I think that actually ties back to what you mentioned around like inputs versus outputs with the team. And I know like uh, I've gone through a number of different iterations on how do you not just make it clear, but for how do we get clear on like, you mm-hmm. know, what is actually important. And I know I I read this book, Great Game of Business, and they talk a lot about like performance, like a, and it was like an end-to-end performance plan and have a team pulling together towards the same goals. And I think in most advice businesses, I know definitely in ours that it's like, it's like a production line in a lot of ways that you know an advisor's doing part of the conversations then there's some inputs then it goes to associates to power planners to admin like there's all these these touches and i we know that things need to be delivered within certain time frames to de- to deliver the end product in the time frame that we want and i built this huge spreadsheet it's a fantastic spreadsheet um had so many inputs where it was like measure all of these inputs from the team and i'm like if you do this it's like paint advice paint by numbers you know i'm going well this makes sense like if you just do all of these things then it's going to lead to the outcomes but what i realized was that everyone was mostly ticking their boxes and getting the things done like they were they were doing the outcomes but they weren't focused on the client retention, the quality of the client conversations, the satisfaction, not to say that they weren't, you know, the, the clients were not satisfied, but they weren't, they were so heavily focused on the inputs that, and I thought that those inputs would drive the success that the, that they just weren't, weren't being achieved. And mm. I think uh, I learned that the one, the outputs are more important, but for, for high performers in particular, they don't want to be told necessarily how to get there. They're happy to hear some ideas and no one wants to reinvent the wheel, but sometimes people have ways that they want to do things and ways that are effective mm. in doing things. So mm. you want to get out of their way. And if people are getting to the outcome, happy clients, revenue targets, compliant advice, you know, referring clients referring because they're soaked with how the, the help that you've provided mm. them and the team is supported and happy in the work that they're doing, then, that's a win and who cares what how they they're getting there um as long as it's all sort of on, on the level so is it was a, yeah I, I think a, an interesting sort of switch to go well that's the focus and a big part of that is that what are those values which is like you know for us it's taking ownership and caring deeply about clients and they're the things mm-hmm. that permeate beyond like just saying well if you do this then this is what's going to happen it's like Mm. not really it's like if you do this in this way and then you deal with clients in this way and you deal with the team in this way and um that's all of that values piece so Mm. how do you for you know for me i i found that like i mentioned the start of my business it was just me then me and um yang and then we you know brought more people in and i i think it as as businesses grow and develop, you you start building a muscle in these areas and you bring in people at the time and, you know, that you're not as focused on these things. So mm. it's inevitable, I, I think, that you need to do change management around some of these key team mm. areas over time. What's a, How should people tackle that or what's an effective approach to to firstly I suppose identify what the most important things are that need to change and then actually implement those changes because it seems to me that it's next to impossible to do everything all at once and then you just learn more and it becomes a a bit outdated anyway 
Are you talking about if a, a specific to core values or just any form of change management? Anything. So you've got like your, you've got, you know, value. I'm talking about team specific um, mm. change, but, you know, you got your values, team rhythm, like the mistakes that you may have made around maybe not reminding people as much, you know, the thinking that they're mind readers, all of those sorts of things that mm. how do you reframe and reshape the 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 way that we work together as a team to to drive closer towards where you want to be as a business yeah so there's there's um there's two there's two natural starting points and i think it's got to you 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 probably would choose your starting point based on the problem you're dealing with those two natural starting points are if you feel like the team that the business is performing well the team are quite good in their roles but there's a little bit of a, a culture gap or um, it's more that there, there's a variability in behaviors and you just don't feel like there's this consistent um, attitude towards work and, and you just kind of feel like there's little elements of toxicity across your team. I think values is definitely the place you need to start. If you feel like it's more of a performance issue, there's a lot of wasted time if, if you know, things are taking too long uh, or uh, the business isn't growing or there's, some, I suppose, more measurable pain across the business. I would be looking at um, bringing your team into a, a business planning framework as your natural starting point. So I'll, I'll quickly cover the, if, if you need to start with values, how I'd go about that, then I'll move into the, the second point I mentioned there. When I used to help businesses come up with their list of core values, it was like this really, um, I don't know, it was like this, this kind of painful process where you're getting teams to fill out surveys and getting their input and then codifying it and going, all right, well, there's some themes here. And it, it took way too long. The way that I've found is the best place, at least as a starting point, to getting a shared set of values that your team uh, can buy into is um, literally to find a list. And I can include one in the show notes if that would help, which is like 100 core values that are literally every single core value you can imagine. And then just getting the team to vote on the five or 10 that they think most represent the type of business they want your, your business to be. Uh, and then finding the commonalities and then meeting with the team going, right, we sent you this survey, here's what we found. And so here's the areas. Uh, the buy-in bit comes in two levels. First is like renaming it. So if the value is, um, I was going to say trust, but that's that's kind of like a ticket to the game. I think if you don't have trust, you don't. You, don't, you probably don't deserve to be in the business in the first place. But um, if it was care as a value and everyone bought into that, actually adding some words to that and not just using the word care, but making it something that the team have created and so they feel more ownership over it. Um, and then going through a brainstorm process with the team going, okay, cool. Well, you know, there's some, you know, we, we've agreed that this area around care, which we've chosen to be, you know, we look after everyone who comes into contact with our business that might be the, the name of the value. And then you go, okay, how can we be living that better? And you brainstorm some tangible ways, whether it's in the advice process or in, in your teammate relationships that you can be living that better. So I think don't try and overcomplicate it. Just give a list of values, get people to vote on them and then get them to brainstorm some actions. Uh, but that's only one part of the process, right? Like Doing that's great, but what happens is people have those great chats and then three months later, it's all forgotten. So what's really yeah. important is that you do start building it into one-on-one -on -one conversations, into your hiring process. If you have a team meeting, maybe you have a section of the team meeting, which is like people call out someone in the team who's living the values. It needs to become more part of your business as usual. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think that that rhythm is is all important. And uh, again, it's challenging. I think, you know, there's there's not a lot of people that live for internal meetings, um, but it is also the key to working together as a team, having those, you know, remind uh, opportunities to remind people, highlight values, highlight good performance, highlight yeah. numbers, metrics, inputs, outputs, all of those things. And then um, one-on-ones and that was a big shift that we've made that we've done that inconsistently in the past but sometimes just that avenue for conversation mm. we we only really started doing it super consistently this year so only you know three months in and just the little things that have come from those conversations which well they seem like little things or, or small conversations mm. but it's translated into some massive change in the business and in the absence of those 
that wouldn't be there. So mm. I think for us, that's been a huge one of baking, baking not just the the internal, the weekly meeting or the retrospective or the advice meeting or whatever into the um, into the calendar, but those other ones and and really rigidly uh, sticking to them. I found to be super super helpful. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, it, it went back to clarity, right? Is that if you get clear on the values and then don't keep reinforcing them, that clarity disappears. So yeah, it's really like just making everything super clear, but bridging the gap between this, you know, slightly pretentious word that sits on or phrase that sits on your wall versus it being really tangible and actionable and making sure that people can live it. Um, but I, I think for, I wouldn't say that every single business out there values is where to start because, you know, as a business leader, you've got 99 problems and you've only got so much bandwidth for change. And so I think it is important that you, you recognize where you are now and what your next move should be. Um, one of the other mistakes I see a lot of leaders make, and it's basically treating their team like kids and wondering why they act like kids. Uh, and mm -hmm. what I'm talking about here is this culture that you see in a lot of businesses, um, all types of small businesses, and, and that includes advice businesses, where you've got, I call it the parents and kids culture. You've got these leaders and they're responsible for all the big adult stuff and we're just the kids. We don't really know what they're in those meeting rooms talking about. We don't really understand if the business is doing well or not. Um, I know that they're talking about this system or this CRM all the time, but I don't actually understand why they're talking about that. Um, you know, I know that the leader has gone on a really nice holiday and just bought a house. So I, I assume that their business is doing well, but I'm not actually really sure if that's the case or not. Um, and so bridging that gap between the conversations you're having at a leadership level and the rest of the team is absolutely critical. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, firstly, it's, it's you know, what we were saying before, that if you're focusing on the outcomes and the, the targets, people just find this subconscious magical way of aligning their behaviour to get there. Um, you can do that in a very direct sense too. I'll talk about that in a sec. But you know, we talk about the challenges that advisors are having finding good people, which is a huge pain point in advice businesses at the moment. And there is this emerging category and, you know, it's obviously always been there, but I think it's getting bigger and bigger, which is, yeah, you know, there's a type of person who wants to run their own business, but there's a type of person who goes, no, I'm happy being an employee, but I almost want to be able to treat this business like I own it. And I want to innovate in my own way. You know, there's, a, there's a term intrapreneur that, that has been coined for this type of person. Um, that uh, literally will give blood, sweat and tears and care about a business and leave their comfort zone and treat it like it's their own, but they're happy to not necessarily be responsible for the ownership of the business and they quite enjoy having their weekends free and being able to take four weeks of guilt-free leave a year. And certainly the best employees in whatever role you're hiring for out there, there's a very strong chance that they don't want to just be there to do a job. They do want to do a great job and they want to know what that looks like but they also want to be involved in you know, whatever percent you can muster, 10, 20, sometimes more percent of their job is working on bigger projects and business improvement and, and taking the business into uncharted waters. And so I think for businesses out there who they have less of a, I suppose, a cultural or an attitude-based challenge with their team and more of a performance base, like I feel like this business still has the handbrake on and I think we could release the handbrake, the solution for someone like that, I think, is to consider ways to bridge the gap between business planning and what the team are doing every single day, creating a, a more shared conversation around the strategic direction of the business. Uh, and most importantly, gathering ideas for how you can hit your goals with the team. Um, and the bit that sometimes confronts the team is also distributing responsibility for implementing some of this stuff to them as well. Uh, a lot of the time people are used to being in these big businesses where they can just give a good idea and everyone's like, that's a great idea, pat on the back. Uh, but the, the, the cultural shift that I, I would recommend you, you entertain here is not just rewarding people for coming up with good ideas, but rewarding them for implementing on those great ideas and executing on them. And uh, that, is, that is another th mistake I see business leaders make and probably more on the optimistic side. Uh, when I see fantastic businesses out there, it's because they've got these teams of linchpins who are who are treating the business like they own it, and they're doing things every single day that are making the business better and better. Yeah, absolutely. It's and it's also like come up with an idea and and a, an idea on how we can implement it. But the the other thing that's sort of in line with that, I think, which I found to be quite helpful, is like 
don't we want the team to come to us with problems but we don't want them to just come to us with problems it's like come to us with a problem and three potential solutions and what you think yep. could work best so i yep. think creating that ownership mindset like you say the parent child like adult child mm -hmm. uh, conversation it's like okay well there's a problem or there's a frustration like one bring it to our attention so that we know that it's something that needs to be prioritized so that we can work on it but two, tell us what you think. Like if you've obviously got ideas, especially mm. if it's your work, but I know that some businesses are a bit resistant to change, but I think that most of the new uh, sort of, you know, more forward thinking businesses realise mm. that things need to change and they need to change, you know, not all the time, but fairly frequently given that everything seems to be changing all the time. So yeah. um, empowering the team to know that you will work on those things, but to, to give like we try to give them a starting point when it comes to, you know, how process or the things that they can do mm. that, that needs to go both ways as well. And I think harnessing that collective brain power is a huge amount of strength in, in businesses. You hire smart people, you hire them for a reason. So utilize the brain that's in there um, and, and, you know, use that to drive business outcomes. But Mate, I could honestly uh, talk to you about this all day, and I, I potentially will if you've got the time uh, after this. But um, my my last question for you is: Well, obviously, we covered a ton of um, ground there in terms of things for people to think about when it comes to team. But I'm a big fan of that premise of like, what is the one thing for for most people? And appreciate that it is different for different businesses. But if I had to say. What is the one thing that that people should be nailing to make everything sort of easier or unnecessary when it comes to um, team? What would be the, the the big focus that you think people should have front of mind? I think I'm going to make an assumption that you've got good people in your business and you just want to get the most out of them. Uh, obviously, if you have the wrong team, there's some bigger discussions that need to happen. But let's assume that you're a business and you've got a good team, but you just feel like, they're leaving 10, 20% in the tank. I 100% think uh, that the best thing you can do, and uh, a lot of leaders wouldn't know this, but having critical numbers uh, that represent the success that you want the business to achieve over, say, 12 months, uh, and not just from a profit point of view, but you know, if we're looking at operations, like what would a successful 12 months be measurably? Uh, and having that level of clarity over here's exactly what a successful year for us looks like, dovetailing that, like showing that to the team and then dovetailing that into a brainstorm where you choose one or more of those numbers and go, how can we get there? And then putting a plan around that, that to me ticks so many boxes uh, because it, it starts to create this culture where the team realise that they uh, are responsible for the success of the business. It doesn't lie in the lap of one or two people. Um, it starts to give people uh, this voice in the business where they realize that they not just can speak up, but they're expected to speak up. Um, but yeah, more to, more to the point, you actually just aligning people in the same direction. So instead of having four or five people who are focusing on slightly different things, and we all know those projects we have in our business that have dragged on far too long because you, know, you get distracted and things things uh, get in the way and you, know, you become like the kind of home renovator who has a bunch of changes to the house that are just 80% done. If you can align the team towards one or two key priorities that you have collectively agreed are going to take the business in the direction you need to take it, you're just going to get more done. And so I think uh, you're, you're going to become a, a business known more for execution rather than ideas. So uh, yeah, for me, the one thing that every business should be doing out there if they want to sustain innovation and success in the future and have a team of people who are taking that business forward uh, and becoming the type of place that great people want to work, it is building your team into the innovation cycle in your business. And that starts with business planning, setting the right outcomes and making sure people realize that when you are having a chat with them about how their job is going, it's not just about the, the advisor hat or the power planner hat or the admin hat, but how well you're participating in this other side of the business that we're expecting you to participate into. I love that on so many levels because I feel like it ties in with a lot of the things that we've already covered, that it forces people to focus on what are the priorities, you know, the things mm. that they should be thinking about, focused on working towards, gives clarity between the team, adult, child, all of that stuff. Mm. Um, 
uh, yeah, I love it. I actually just made a note there that we need to do that a little bit better over the next little while. So, uh, mate, thank you so much for sharing your insights. For anyone that's keen to learn more about what you do, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yeah, so website, always a good place to start, which is human to humantohumancomau to spell T-O. Uh, but I also have a lot of conversations on LinkedIn, so feel free to find me on LinkedIn. My username is Michael J. Back. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions that are yeah, big or small that I can just answer over LinkedIn, I'd be happy to too. So I'd love to help in any way I can. Awesome, mate. Well, thank you again. Really appreciate it. I'll catch you next time. Sounds good. Thank you for having me, Ben. Always a pleasure, Backy. See you, bud.